Hey everyone, just a quick note before we begin the show, around the 30 minute mark and onwards, Mike's audio gets a little glitchy. We did our best to smooth it over, but the decrease in quality is still noticeable, so apologies for that, but with that being said, on with the show. Hey, and welcome back to Game Talk. I'm your host, Sam and me on today. I'm joined by Connor. Hey, guys. And Mike. Hello. And our topic today is games that split audiences. And this was Connor's idea, so I'll just hand it off to him now. Yeah, so the thing that inspired this was uh, I've been playing a ton of Monster Hunter recently, and uh, a lot of people want different things from those games. Some of some people come to those games... Uh, and all they care about is like a flashy big boss fight. But then other people come to those games and uh, are interested in the ecology side and the not not really lore, but world building of these more grounded monsters and uh, where they fit into the ecology and the actual preparation for the hunt and getting all your gear together and all the prep time and everything. And uh, I thought it was interesting how Capcom manages to make both of those groups happy. You, you also have something like Mario, where Mario has a lot of fans that... Uh, and, I, and I think Mario did a pretty bad job of this until pretty much Mario Odyssey, where they laid down a plan where 3D Mario was split. You had people who liked Super Mario 64 and Super Mario Sunshine for their more open, exploratory gameplay... And then Super Mario Galaxy was kind of a step away from that towards linear level design. And then 3D Land and 3D World were extremely linear level design with no real open exploration at all. Right. And the way Nintendo solved that was to just say, hey, like we see these as separate series now. Yeah, I feel like if a game franchise is around long enough, I feel like this inevitably happens where the audience just grows so big that game starts meaning different things to different people right i agree you also have like sonic has this problem bad where uh a lot of people just want the classic games and a lot of people just want the, the newer 3d games the new, the more modern boost stuff and uh sega's solution is actually terrible i think which is that they just keep trying to make one game that makes everyone happy and it doesn't work Right. Yeah, they keep spitting out games that are like, "Oh, we it has boost, but it has 2D." But it worked it once. Has... Sonic Generations was great, but it hasn't worked since then. Yeah, and the adventure fans are left in the in the cold oh yeah completely. Just, yeah, I mean, all I really care about is a Chow Garden. Yeah, the rest the, of it, I could that's hit, the big thing. Take it or leave it. But God, I would kill for a Chow Garden. It is astounding yeah. that that does not exist in any form. Like no mobile Chow game. Like, no that mobile should be Chow a, Really, nobody shooting. like no. No other AAA effort has stepped in to fill that gap either, or indie. Like, there's no Stardew Valley of Chow Gardens. There was the Sega's been big into NFTs, right? I don't think so. You're thinking of Square Enix? I thought they were. Yeah, I mean, it might be Square Enix. Uh, but come on, J just I I wouldn't care. Just give me would, the Chow I Garden. Compromise NFTs. my values in that way, but <laughs> I I wouldn't compromise my my values. But please, just give us something. Just show that you remember. But it's just You'll get interesting. Sonic Forces too, and like it. Yeah. Yeah, we're just oh, ugh. Jesus. I think Sonic Superstars was fine, it, but, it, but so, to my point, Sonic Superstars was fine. Are are we ignoring Sonic Frontiers? Does that just not exist? Sonic Frontiers was just fine, but it also, I guess, okay. Son Sonic Superstars and Sonic Frontiers kind of fit the mold, where they put the modern stuff in one game and the classic stuff in another game, and that kind of works. Uh, the only reason it doesn't work is that Sonic Frontiers was just kind of mid. I've really soured on it since it came out. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think there are countless examples of split audiences for game franchises, but the one I think of the most is probably Zelda, where I feel yeah. like there's there's three distinct camps, probably two overall camps. Three. Uh, the major, the well, three total, but I think two major ones, where the major ones are pre-Breath of the Wild, post-Breath of the Wild. I feel like there's a very strict line in the sand for a lot of fans and granted i think most fans really do appreciate the newer zelda games but a lot of people were turned off by breath of the wild because it turned zelda into something that was not zelda to them and they were not able to see it as a sort of evolution of the franchise which i see it that way see my my solution to that problem 
It's because the the other big camp is like 2D and 3D Zelda. The the split is Ocarina right. of Time. And my yep. solution to that personally would be your 3D Zelda is the the new open air stuff and then we can bring back 2D Zelda. I mean the last 2D Zelda game was on the 3DS. It was a long time ago. Uh yeah, not but counting even a in remake. That- even in that scenario, there will be an audience that wants a 3D Zelda in the same vein as like Wind Waker, Twilight Princess, Ocarina of Time. There's always somebody left out. But I, I just think with the way a modern 2D, like a 2.5D game can look, I think you can do, I think you could meet in the middle because that audience is smaller than the Breath of the Wild audience. The people that like the new right. formula. The audience is smaller. The people that are hungry for the old stuff. So if you could meet in the middle to combine those audiences and make a compelling story, linear, 2D, 2.5D Zelda game, sort of like A Link Between Worlds, I think there's a huge audience for that. And so, I, I do think there's 2D Zelda is a lost art in my mind. Right, yeah. It's been a while. It was A Link Between Worlds was the last real one. I mean, we had some remakes in the, in the interim, but yeah. an interesting question I have to pose to the two of you. Should... Nintendo even really care because I guess from their perspective Zelda is the biggest it's ever been has more fans than it's ever had so to them I think this is what Zelda is now I I agree with that my counter to that is that it takes what eight years seven years I know six how long did it take to make it took seven years Breath to make. of the Wild was 2017 Tears of the Kingdom was 2023 yeah so six years to make Tears of the Kingdom, it doesn't take that long to make a 2D Zelda game. It doesn't take that budget to make a 2D Zelda game. Like, not every single game in a franchise has to be its best-selling entry ever. Right, yeah. That, I just, that would be I'm my, curious, though, you know, yeah. It's not, you're not wasting anything to make a 2D Zelda game. I'm just curious how it looks from the developer's perspective. Like, obviously, as a fan, I would be thrilled to get a 2D Zelda. But I guess... In terms of return on investment, they might just see it as, okay, we need to put out these big Zelda titles because this is what brings in the fans and the money, etc. I agree, but Link's Awakening, the remake, I think this is the remake I'm looking at. Yeah, Nintendo Switch, Link's Awakening. It sold six and a half million copies. Like, it's not a slouch. It's not Breath of the Wild numbers, but it's certainly no slouch. And they even, they outsourced... Uh, Link's Awakening remake, right? I believe someone else made that. In fact, uh, I don't, I don't know who made that, but Zelda actually has a history of being outsourced. Capcom actually made some really good Zelda games back in the day. They made Minish Cap, and they made both oh, Oracle Cap- games. Capcom made Minish Cap. Yeah, let me let me fact check that. But that's actually really imp- okay. So it was I just double checked. It was developed by Grezzo and published by Nintendo. But that was uh, a link. That was um, the remake. Right, Link's Awakening remake. But like a remake is one thing, but for another studio entirely to make a Zelda game from scratch is very impressive to me. And the Minish and those, Cap is good. Those, yeah, those games weren't the, slouches. The, the Oracles, those were like, yeah. And yeah. that's what I'm saying. Like, I, I, Frankly, I would give it to Capcom again because Capcom is on fire lately. Uh, I would kill for if some Capcom 2D Zelda games. Oh my God. Yes, sign me up. Just Capcom anything, really. They're They're probably the best developer in the world right now or at least one of them just an aside because i've been on i've been on a huge monster hunter kick i didn't know this but monster hunter world is capcom's best-selling game of all time i didn't know that second place is monster hunter rise so that's two back-to-back monster hunter games being their wow. top two and i don't know i can't find someone to play these games with me 25 million copies of monster hunter world sold that's crazy and i can't find anybody to play it with what like yeah, i knew monster hunter was big but i didn't know it was that big like do you it, think uh, it wasn't maybe before just more before popular, world like so not what happened US? with monster hunter just a diatribe monster hunter 4 ultimate got a following in the united states and it was the first one to really get that it sold something like six million copies i think and i think that woke them up they were like all right we we found a footing in the West. The next one is going to be called Monster Hunter World. It's going to be about the Monster Hunters going to the New World, which is an obvious analog for expansion to America. And it did. It just it sold really well in America. It moved 20 million units and then I think another 5 million for its uh, bundle with its expansion, Iceborne. And they, they just did it. And it's just a household name now. 
Like, yeah, Monster Hunter World was massive. Before that, most people really didn't know what Monster Hunter was in the West. Yeah, I I started on Four Ultimate, and it was yeah. pretty niche. I knew one other person that played it, and then World just I, I don't know. Every streamer played it. Every uh, every Let's Player took everyone a look at it. Yeah, it, it was like, just huge. Everyone was playing World. And Monster Hunter on topic, uh, it made me think of this. Monster Hunter has a really cool solution to the problem of a split audience, which is that it it essentially there the fans call them the mainline and the portable series although that's kind of lost its meaning in the modern day but monster hunter world is monster hunter 5 it is the mainline entry and then it was followed up with monster hunter rise which was originally switch exclusive so it being the portable entry makes sense but it got ported to everything else which muddies the waters a little bit But Monster Hunter World has these long hunts that can be like 30 minutes to an hour long sometimes where you have to really track the monster. You don't know where it's going to be and you got to do all your prep work and it's a long grueling fight once you actually find it. Where Monster Hunter Rise is uh, a portable entry so all the monsters are marked on the map. You know exactly where to go. But they're way more experimental with their combat. Everybody's doing way more damage. Everybody has way less HP. The fights are like 10 minutes long instead of 30 minutes to an hour. And uh, it's like you could play it on the bus is the difference. And uh, it's interesting because all these new players that jumped on with World don't know that these are separate series. All they saw was Monster Hunter World came out, Monster Hunter Rise came out. It is not immediately clear that these are technically two different series. Yeah, I mean, I didn't know that. Yeah, these are these are two different development teams. And the, the reason they do that is that they can get a mainline game, mainline DLC the next year, portable game the next year, portable DLC the next year, mainline game the next year, and you're getting Monster Hunter content more or less every year. And it's a it's a good system that they have, but they do not communicate very well to their new audience that these are essentially not the same series. They share a lot of DNA but Rise plays pretty differently from World, and it's not because they chose a new direction. It's because they just have two simultaneous series running side by side. It's because they're different games. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just, I, I don't know, I think it's a pretty... It'd be a really good solution to that problem if they would communicate it. But it's also difficult to me- communicate because I also think calling Monster Hunter World the mainline entry and Monster Hunter Rise the portable entry discredits rise because it makes it seem like the budget game when it's not you know it was you know there are plenty of people who would prefer it to world a lot actually a lot of people like that faster frenetic combat and a lot of people like world slower slower burn kind of thing and wilds is going to be more similar to world because it's another mainline entry it's monster hunter six yeah i'm very excited for that one yeah yeah Um, me too yeah so Just racking my brains, like a prominent one for me that comes to mind is the split between The Last of Us one and two. Oh yeah, I think that's that's a narrative issue more so than anything else. Yeah, so that it was kind of interesting because since those games are so story based, it basically became I really dislike the story of two or I really like the story of two, and. I mean, without getting into spoilers, right, I really applaud Naughty Dog's direction because surely they knew going into making that game that it was going to be extremely controversial. But they went ahead and did it anyway. They told the story they wanted to tell. And I I bet, like, because of the decisions they made for the Part 2 story, Part 3's audience is probably going to be less like obviously it's still going to sell millions and millions of copies but like i do think there is a distinct camp here that only likes the last of us one and has kind of sworn off other last of us uh it's games me. it's me <laughs> yeah i mean like yeah we have one guy among us right now like i was it's not too uncommon i like the whole story of one where i was like this this found family kind of journey and then I didn't even play two. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna lie. I didn't play two, but everything I saw of two was it kind of removed one of the whole dynamic of one, in vain of a revenge story, but a revenge story in the Last of Us fashion where you feel terrible for it. And I'm just, I just didn't want to feel bad playing a video game anymore. No, I, I think that's that's totally valid. Like my stance on the Last of Us two is that I think 
it was incredible that that game made me feel the way I felt, even though like it was largely terrible. But for like a piece of art to do that, I thought was like really cool. But I, I definitely understand, you know, like there's and you're not alone, Mike. There's a pretty notable chunk of people that were Last of Us fans that kind of swore off two and subsequent games. So I'm curious to see what Naughty Dog does for three, because I I wonder if they're going to try and get some of those fans back or really sort of double down on their own, like this is the story I want to tell kind of mentality. For what it's, it's worth... It's truck, man. He's going he's, he's gonna to keep, he's gonna keep cooking. For he what is. it's worth, Mike, I don't think you're supposed to feel good at the end of The Last of Us Part 1. <laughs> I didn't, but at the same time, like... See, the, the Last of Us invites all these complex questions because, I mean, to an extent, I, I mean, I think this is valid. I did feel kind of good at the end of Last of Us 1 because I felt the choice made at the end, well, very controversial. Like, I put myself, it's so hard to talk okay, about Last of Us without s- spoilers, can, but yeah. We're, we're, let's just go with spoilers. It's Last of Us 1. Yeah, so, played Last yeah, of Us so, 1 okay, in the yeah, current year. We'll, it's we'll spoil the Last of Us times. 1. You're right. Yeah, the show is out like, and everything. So I thought Joel killing everyone at the hospital to save Ellie was the correct choice. And if I was in his ch- yeah. shoes, I would have done the same. But obviously, that is up for huge debate. I agree, but none of the characters feel good about that. Like, you're no, not yeah, supposed character- to be like, happy that Ellie any of that feels <laughs> uncomfortable. A- Joel's uncomfortable. He's lying to her yeah. face. You know, it's... But it's like, not a heartwarming story. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. It's not... It wasn't meant to be. Yeah. But I'm just saying, like... I don't know. I I don't like what you said that like I don't want to play a video game that makes me feel bad because I feel like a lot of what The Last of Us Part 1 was about was feeling bad. Like Yeah, were- man. It's just in comparison to Part 2, it's like sunshine yeah. and daisies really. But But yeah, that that was just one example I wanted to highlight a major game franchise that had a pretty distinct divide. And it's kind of unique too because it's a narrative divide as opposed to like a gameplay divide like the other examples we discussed. Yeah. Right. And I think, like, in modern day, I could go on to the side topic that I had planned at some point in the future, but I think I'll save that for a whole episode. It is very easy for a game to be super polarized nowadays. Yeah, I mean, gaming's just big, bigger than it's been. It's I think it's interesting it's how... And, like, everyone's hyper online now, and everyone's yeah, terminally. Just, yeah. yeah, it's it's... It's interesting how, like, Fortnite juggles this. Uh, Fortnite has... Every season of Fortnite is somebody's favorite. Every map is somebody's favorite, and they're constantly changing it. They're they're constantly taking someone's favorite thing out of the game, and that's crazy. That's what a what a platform to be running. You know, there are people nostalgic. There are people nostalgic for like Fortnite the way it was six months ago. You know, it's, that's, yeah, that's that's hard for me to even wrap my head around as someone who really only played Fortnite when it became popular around like season one. Yeah. Yeah, it it's constantly changing. It was really weird to uh because they are wrong. I I will say they're they're all wrong. Fortnite is better now than it's ever been. It's always improving. Sure there are like some fun things that I miss that aren't in the game right now, but they'll come back. They just that's it's their business model is that they don't keep the good stuff in it all the time so that they can get you hype when they bring it back. But when they did old school Fortnite, oh my god, it was boring. The old map is terrible like it doesn't fit the new mechanics it's slow it's a bunch of big wide open fields so let me just weigh in here as someone who has not interfaced with new fortnite so maybe i'm just completely off base but i kind of like the simplicity of the old map like i look at fortnite now and it's just like so many mechanics packed in like one guy's web slinging around the other one's shooting off a kamameha i'm like I kind of just like the simplicity, and, and granted, that's cool, right? Like that, all that stuff can coexist in one world. But I really did enjoy the simplicity of like, okay, well, you've got some guns, you've got a pickaxe, and you've got some materials. So I I play zero build for what it's worth, which does lower the complexity substantially. Um, but oh, yeah, especially once, the old map. Doesn't I, I just want to weigh in again once, like, because I did used to play Fortnite quite a bit back in the day. But once it got super sweaty, where like people were just building, oh my God, yeah. I was just like, "This is I'm not ever playing this again. This no, is not I was something never I want to." Yeah. So they introduced a zero build mode for for boomers like us, and uh, I really I still enjoy it. I play it with some friends. I imagine that's the most popular mode, right? Like, I don't know. I don't know. I've if never looked at the numbers. Want to put up with the 
Because, like, building is such a huge advantage if you're, like, extremely good at it that but, it's just... It's but that just was the problem with that old map. You have map. no shot of winning. That old map assumed that you were going to, like, stop to chop down a tree or whatever. And if you're playing zero build, you have no reason to do that. And so you would spend minutes at a time just running through a forest with nothing in it. No players to shoot yeah. at. No, no, just nothing. Just very boring. But I, I guess, I don't know why I'm defending Fortnite, but I, here I am. But I kind of like that, too, where, like... I remember I had memories of just me and my friends hiding out in a house, just like hoping no one finds us, waiting for the circle to close down, just having that anxiety of like, okay, is there actually someone around here? That's fair. I remember that feeling in PUBG. I never really felt that in Fortnite. Fortnite's just a more aggressive, a more aggressive game for me than PUBG was. PUBG had a lot of hiding and waiting, and I do remember that fondly. I thought it was very neat to just find somewhere to camp out. It'd be very tense. I was very yeah, good at it. That though. tension, like, yeah, we the way we played Fortnite back in the day, there was definitely tension, and it was it was good tension. Like, it made the game more exciting. But obviously, Fortnite now is completely different from how it was back then. And I imagine if I picked it up now, I would like it for entirely different reasons. Yeah, I I don't know if it's just that my play style is different, but there is. I mean, there is tension, but there's no. There's very little quiet time in Fortnite now. There, there are vehicles. There are just a lot. There's a lot of ways to move around the map quickly, and uh, I'm moving from fight to fight pretty quickly. And if you're not doing that, you're not going to have good enough gear at the end of the game uh, to win. You're going to get you know even if you do yeah. hide for the whole game, uh, which is reasonably easy to do, you're just going to get you're going to have your blue weapons and you're going to be against somebody that has gold weapons at the end and you're going to lose. <laughs> right. So that's a that's a tangent. But uh, but I think that's a good example. Like people do want different things from Fortnite. There are people that want uh I mean hell they they had to split the player base in half by introducing zero build. Uh because some people wanted the sweaty building mechanics and everything and a lot of people didn't. It was like the most requested feature was a a game mode with no building. Right. Yeah, and I remember at first they were pretty hesitant to do that, but the the voice for that was just too vocal. It is scary to split your, like, that. that's an interesting aside, is that in one game, splitting your player base can be very dangerous. It's why, um, it's why Apex Legends doesn't want to introduce a second map, I think. They, they, they want one map at a time, so you don't get to choose. It's why, um, Halo does its matchmaking the way it does. They're afraid that if they let you choose the exact game mode you want to play, it would fracture the player base too much. They wouldn't have a big enough pool. Which is an interesting choice. Yeah, because that's strange, though, because that, that definitely worked yeah. back in the day. I don't know. I, I think they might have had more players back in the day. I'm not Maybe. sure what yeah, I don't Infinite's know. player number looks like. They uh, The Sea of Thieves got rid of a game mode. They just completely got rid of it. Sea of Thieves used to have two game modes, Adventure and Arena. And Arena was pretty small uh, because you had to be pretty sweaty to enjoy it. <laughs> you had to be... It was a very difficult game mode. I, I never got good at it. I kind of wish they would bring it back so that I could see what it was like now that I am good. But they uh, they eventually came to the decision to just shut it down entirely because they wanted the entire player base to be in adventure mode together uh, so that they could focus all their development in one place. And I think it was the right call. And they just add stuff that kind of... They add the arena play style as events to adventure mode sometimes and i think that's a good compromise another way of getting around the issue so where do you all fall for a lot of these splits like it gun to my head if you were to say like you can only pick one old zelda or new zelda as in like pre breath of the wild post i would probably pick post even though pre's are some of my favorite games i'm firmly in uh like for Zelda, I'm post Ocarina and post Breath of the Wild. Yeah. Like, Ocarina set a foundation and created a lot of good games. Breath of the Wild was, there was a good concept there. It just wasn't realized. And Tears of the Kingdom did everything that Breath of the Wild did. It's but hard then, to answer because we have like a complete data set for what exists before Breath of the Wild, and we only have two games post Breath of yeah. the Wild. Like, we don't know if the next Zelda game is going to be even anything resembling Breath of the Wild. Yeah, we don't. I, I, it will. <laughs> I think it's pretty well, likely. I mean, we talked about this, I think, last week or the week before, but I have a feeling that it's going to be something else entirely, like in a further evolution. 
Like, yes, there will be Bones of Breath of the Wild, but I think we'll see a similar jump to what we saw from, like, Ocarina of Time to Breath of the Wild. I think yeah. it needs to, because uh, we can see, like, the Ocarina of Time formula was pretty good for a few games, and then it got very, very stale. And I wouldn't want to go back to it. I, I mean, I, I wouldn't be mad if they went back to it. I would be mad if they went back to it instead of doing something new. Like, if, it was, if I was getting both, I could live with that. <laughs> pretty happily but i i don't know it just felt done to death like if you if you sit down and draw them out on paper ocarina of time wind waker and twilight princess look very similar skyward sword is not much different the only the only real outlier yeah. in there is majora's mask and really it's not that different either so i'm glad that they moved on so that's interesting we're all three of us are kind of in the same camp there we have tastes <laughs> oh man <laughs> So, another one popped into my head, and it, you can't just really think of sequels, right? Because a, most of the time, I feel like the audience really just moves on to the next game, but there are some cases, like the ones we're highlighting, where that isn't the case. Smash Bros. And I'm firmly in Smash Ultimate is the best Smash Bros. has ever been. I think it's going to be very hard to top it. I think Smash Ultimate is probably the best just from like a content perspective. But from a gameplay perspective, Melee still takes it for me. And those are two the two real, like, kind of factions that remain of Smash Brothers. Like, yes, there are N64 Smash tournaments, but in terms of, like, size and scope, like, Melee and Ultimate are the two big pillars, which is interesting because Smash has had how many games now? One, two, three, four, five? If you include five Project M6, entries. which... Yeah. Right. So, yeah, out of all of those, only two have stood the test of time. And I don't see either of them really, I guess, fading into obscurity anytime soon. Ultimate will get replaced if they can replicate what made it great in the next one, I think. I don't think it'll stick around. Melee is not going to be replicated because the things people like about it were unintentional. <laughs> and I 100% think it would be a mistake to bring any of those things back. Uh, because they, they raised the skill floor in a way that's just really frustrating for a player that isn't trying to be competitive. Right, yeah. No, I, I think I agree with you. I, I like that Melee still exists, and it can just exist there forever. Exactly, And yeah. Sakurai can do whatever he wants with the new Smash games. I just wanted to highlight that as there is a very distinct split there where there were iterations and uh, sequels and what have you, but the Melee community never budged. <laughs> People just love their wave dashing. Yeah. And uh, specifically wave dashing, I think, would be a huge mistake to bring back. Like, the people that enjoy it are not wrong for enjoying it, but it just... Well, you even... You can wave dash in uh, Ultimate. It's just, like, it's way... It's meaningless, yeah. Yeah, it's, you can, like, wave dash once yeah. when you land or something. Yeah. And I've seen it used in, like, tournaments. So, But, like, like you said, right? Like, it doesn't really raise the skill floor any because it's such a largely irrelevant mechanic. Yeah, like wave dash is one of those things was, in melee. If you cannot do it, you do not get to play. You basically just lose yeah. to someone who can do it. Yeah, and that's just an uninteresting mechanic. I would say, like, if you're going to do that, just make the movement speed faster. Yeah, and L canceling too. That's just oh, man. Yeah, but yeah, I love it for it. I don't know enough about fighting games. I bet there's a huge. I mean, oh, people yeah. are still playing Street Fighter Two. Right. Yeah, fighting games in particular. I feel like there's camps sort of form, and people don't really move on. Yeah, And, like, obviously, like, that's not always the case. Like we said, with, you know, Brawl. No one's playing Brawl in the Year of Our Lord 2024. Tripping was or, such or a Or Smash mechanic. U, Wii U. So. No, I think Smash U just got replaced. Smash U didn't have some, like, big It was very flaw. similar to Ultimate. It just got replaced by Ultimate because Ultimate did everything it did well better. Ultimate yeah. is just... Ultimate is a, going to be a very difficult game to beat. It is just the ultimate Smash Bros. game in many ways. I think um, I think that about Mario Kart too. I think Mario Kart Eight, like there are Double Dash is the one I hear people still clinging to. But I am strongly really? of the opinion that every single Mario Kart game is better than the yeah, one before I think it. For, for in my, I don't know. From what I see, it seems like Mario Kart. The audience largely just moves on with each one. Yeah, there's no real camp. On the older I, ones, like no, I know some people that are huge double dash heads. 
Uh, and maybe that's I mean, just I know some people who are was... huge N64 Mario Kart heads to this day, just because I think that's really? just what you grew up with. Yeah. Like, that's yeah, what I we think grew that's up how with. It is. The best Mario Kart is the one I was playing when I was eight. <laughs> like, right. Yeah. But I, I think there's a distinction between Mario Kart and Smash Brothers, because oh, yeah. I do think, for the most part, everyone just moves on with Mario Kart and is excited for the next yeah. one. That's the case. Yeah, with I agree. They, they, don't, they have not gone in the same way. That. Now, some... I think my favorite one that people never move on from is... I think Marvel vs. Capcom is one of those fighting games that people will play forever. Like on the Dreamcast? Yeah, Marvel vs. Capcom 3, I think, is the last one that people still play. That was 360, right? Yeah. Like, everyone after that hasn't been touched. None of the modern ones have been touched. I didn't know they made any more. That one on the 360 yeah. was fire, though. Yeah, that's that's why. Like, Infinite yeah. was garbage, and it didn't go anywhere. Yeah. And for a game that came out, you know, two console generations to still be popular is wild in its own right. Yeah, split fan bases for fighting games. I feel like that's just the norm. Yeah. I did want to bring up, I guess, in a similar vein to Zelda, I guess we can talk about From Software now, because there's definitely... I definitely see people saying that they did not like the Elden Ring open style and prefer the more linear From Soft games. I haven't like heard Dark that Soul. from anybody. I've seen that opinion online. I don't think it's very popular, but I think there's enough it. to where there's a camp there. And I, I, I do get it, it right? Yeah. There's something to be said about Dark Souls, Bloodborne. It has a certain edge that Elden Ring lacks. But again, if you were to ask me, you can only have one or the other, I would 100% of the time choose Elden Ring. Because I, I think, think yeah. the openness, what what opening up the Dark Souls formula did for that franchise is really special, in my opinion. I agree. I think uh, I see the case that like you can miss stuff in Dark Souls. It is possible. In fact, it's likely because there is some stuff off the beaten path. Yeah, you almost certainly missed stuff in Elden Ring just oh, because yeah. it's such a wide game. There's just so much stuff everywhere. You could miss critical boss fights, even. And no, uh, I don't think any single human being on their first playthrough of Elden Ring saw everything. I I firmly believe that it's unlikely <laughs> it's yeah and i i get why some people wouldn't like that uh yeah and, and, and also like a dark souls game was just shorter like it took me like 80 hours or something right to beat Elden Elden Ring Ring. Was a behemoth dark souls and, was like 20 hours if you're good at it 30 to 50 if you're we can't forget the good. third uh from software camp who just won armored core games yeah like mike yeah i i don't think that's a fair they should have two different teams, like Armored Core and Dark uh, Armored Core and so Elden different. Ring shouldn't be related. Yeah, so like I don't know, people shouldn't even be. That, that's yeah, just it's a just... silly conversation, I think. But yeah, I, th- I think the more interesting conversation is the pre-post Elden Ring, yeah, debate, and and I guess you know similarly with Zelda, like the response to Elden Ring was just massive. Like it went mainstream in a way that they were not even dreaming of, which is after Dark Souls had gone mainstream in a way they weren't yeah. even dreaming of. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I mean, I don't think they would ever go back, which is sad to me, but I will say that even if they don't go back, I feel like the uh, Souls likes that have been coming out recently have been of increasingly higher quality Yeah, that almost sort of fill that void now. Like Lies of P. I hear is very, very good and essentially just a from software game. We've been saying we hear it for like a year. Right. Now. I, I I've had play it installed it. There's just too much en- stuff to play. I've had it installed the entire time. So much to like play. day one I installed that game and I've not yeah, launched it. It looks a it looks time. fun. I yeah. wanna play it. It's just video games be going crazy, yeah. Yeah. No, I'm too busy replaying games from twenty eighteen. Uh no I, I also feel like Elden Ring already compromises pretty cleanly like it has those classic dungeons in it that are that feel like a dark souls level and like that feels like it in it feels almost like there was a game between dark souls 3 and elden ring that was too open and they course corrected so that they can make elden ring which got it right you know but that but that that fictional less good game never happened they just got it right the first time yeah, which is yeah don't. speaks to the quality of from software yeah no they just knew what they were doing they knew what the people wanted and they they don't miss <laughs> yeah 
So I guess what I'm saying is, if you yearn for the days of Dark Souls, play Lies of P. Yeah, true. And Bloodborne, I guess. Uh, no, no one's going to touch Bloodborne. That's an well, old I mean, console now. I think Lies of P is very similar to uh, Bloodborne. Yeah, Lies of P was heavily inspired by Bloodborne. You know, at this point, I feel like Bloodborne's never going to leave its home console. No, no, and we've I talked think... about this. I, I positive it is like I, it just would be it's, so it's stupid like for Sony not to do anything you know? with it. It'll be a Switch Six. It, yeah, it'll be a Switch Six launch. launch title. PlayStation Six. Yeah, I could, I could see it. PlayStation call, Six yeah. exclusive launch title. And then it'll come to PC. Maybe years later. I mean, Demon Souls is on PC, right? Or is it? I don't no, know. It no, might not, not be. No, it's it's not. Oh, I've not played well. It. Yeah, so maybe you'll never play Bloodborne. Yeah. Uh, well, I have Bloodborne on my PS4. I just hate playing my PS4. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, another game, I guess, uh, franchise, Final Fantasy, right? Because those games are so distinct from one another that yeah, it's a weird one. Yeah, I, you, I feel like, like I'm in the games. I'm in the small camp that loves 15 so much. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think the the biggest break was probably between the the two D JRPGs and then like the more open world three D ones. So I guess they, between six and seven, they did that to themselves though. Moving well, not, I mean, they didn't do it to themselves. I don't, I don't want to blame them. They they made the right call, but they moved from Nintendo to PlayStation, and not not everybody. Well, I mean, most people got a PlayStation. It, it won that console gen, but not everybody. You know, the people that were on N sixty four just didn't get a Final Fantasy. Yeah. I don't know. I don't think I know anybody that like, or or have even read somebody that is like longing for the old. Right. Yeah. I, I was thinking about that one because Final Fantasy is a unique one where each game is intentionally very different from the previous one, and yes. p- the Final Fantasy fans know that. So most of them just move on to the next one. Like there are some that don't go over well with the larger Final Fantasy audience, like fifteen actually. Yeah. And God, I guess I 13. But uh, I think the two biggest Final Fantasy camps are the mainline game enjoyers and then the MMO enjoyers. Oh, we don't yeah. talk about them. Because, like, Final about. Fantasy 14 is one of the biggest MMOs in the world. And I believe Final Fantasy 11 was also an MMO. Yes. Which is and also so fascinating good, for, for a game franchise to, to go in directions like that. Monster Hunter had an MMO. Did it really? Yeah, I forget what it was called. Um, Frontiers, maybe? That might be wrong. Don't quote me on that. Uh, it never came to the West. It was Jap- Japan only. So, and okay. it had yeah. it had very few monsters, and it had exclusive monsters that have never been in another game. But yeah, uh, that was just a thing for Asian games, I think, for a while there, was to have an MMO. There was a Dragon Ball MMO. There was a Dragon Ball Online. There was a... Uh, what else? There, there, I, I used to know a lot about MMOs, and there were a couple of really weird ones you wouldn't expect. I mean, I've been there, dude. Like, I remember being bored as a kid and just Googling what MMO I should play. Yeah, just because they were usually free, uh, you know, yeah. up to a certain level. Yeah. And plus, there's just, a, I guess, a charm to an MMO that really can't be captured in any other game genre, I feel. But no, that charm comes a popular... at a downside. Yeah, it's becoming a popular thing to try to emulate, like with Destiny and Monster Hunter to an extent is, you know, they have their gathering hubs and stuff. They try. It doesn't really work, but they try. And uh, Sea of Thieves, I would argue, is trying to pretend that there's a lot more players in the server than there actually are. Yeah. But yeah, I I don't know. Final Fantasy XIV, it always intrigues me, but then the thing that stops me from actually trying it is just that i don't want to only play one game and i feel like if i ever get into an mmo it'll be the only game i play and i don't want to find myself in that situation says the diablo 4 enjoyer (laughs) yeah man like diablo 4 (laughs) derailed my life (laughs) it did you you still haven't finished tears of the kingdom because i have not yeah yeah it messed you up (laughs) dude at this point i'm honestly just holding out hope for Tears of the Kingdom running at 60 frames per second on Switch 2, which is like right. the biggest copium ever. Copium, but... pure copium, yeah. But yeah, I don't even like at this point, is the Switch 2 even real? Or is this it's real, man? We, it's like, real. Gaslit ourselves into where there's smoke, there's fire, Mike. Oh, I, you I all are making fun of me. Smoke here. 
But game devs are working on Switch 2 games. Like, it's not really a secret anymore. Yeah, I know. I just but, like making fun of you. <laughs> yeah, I was so sure it was going to be this year. You put year, everything on it being this year. I was year. 100% sure. Ugh. I'm mad. <laughs> All right. Are there any other examples we want to touch on? I feel like we talked about a few, but uh, there's surely many more. Yeah, I mean, I feel like this is one of those things I feel like you have to be plugged in to a game like tank controls versus modern controls in resident evil i bet i bet you there's a million people that want to argue that but i'm just not plugged really? in to uh does anyone really yearn for the days of tank control there has yeah. to be somebody oh, yeah, sure. who's like dying over the fact that they can't turn like they're trying to turn an m1 abrams you know people love to tank like there there is a huge contingent of people who think the games are less scary because you have better control of the character I suppose and, that uh, might be true to an extent, but yeah. I would still rather have better control of my character. Yeah, I fall into that camp. Well, I actually don't even know, because I, I enjoyed Signalis, which uh, was tank controls. It was emulating old Resident Evil, and uh, I really enjoyed it. So I think there's a case to be made for it, uh, but it it's not going to have that mass market appeal that an over-the-shoulder game does. Right. But that was just an example. Like, there... I. I if you're plugged into an audience, you're going to know enough about it to know the the divides and stuff. And I think we've talked about everything I'm plugged into enough to know. <laughs> I mean, modded versus vanilla in any game that supports mods. Uh, I don't think there's man. a lot of people arguing I'm for... Firmly, yeah. yeah. There are some vanilla believers. I know Minecraft has its vanilla believers. I like a first playthrough of a game to be vanilla. Uh, after that, do whatever you want. But I, I like to enjoy the artist's vision first before I start tampering with it. Yeah, I agree with that. But I think, you know, modding support improves every game that it's included in. I would say that as well. But I, I remember... I, I knew... I, I know someone who uh, only plays Fallout 4 unmodded and really enjoys it, and I think they're they're sick in the head, honestly. My first playthrough of Factorio, I desperately wanted it to be vanilla, but I was playing through it with somebody, and he like refused to play if we didn't install a couple of like quality of life mods and stuff. And as a result, I, I didn't actually know what was vanilla and what wasn't because I didn't really pay attention to the mod list. And uh, I don't know. It made the game easier. I kind of wish we hadn't done it. I'm a purist. Yeah. Some would say. All right. Yeah. I'm sure there's, I'm missing some stuff that I want to talk about, but can't think of it right now. So I think I'm good unless you guys have any other games you want to shout out. Nope. I have nothing. All right, what are you all playing? I have been... Uh, I played over 20 hours of Monster Hunter World this weekend. <laughs> wow. Really? I just... I, I fired it up. I w it was like just a lazy Saturday. I didn't have any plans. And I was just like, you know... I remember... And weirdly, I, I remember beating this game. I remember rolling credits on it. I haven't rolled credits on it this time yet, but I've more than doubled my playtime, and I know I've seen stuff that I didn't see last time, so I don't and know you're what playing, I remember. Uh, Iceborne. I bought Iceborne, but I haven't gotten to the Iceborne content yet. All of the Iceborne content is after you finish the uh, the main game. The way Monster That's Hunter crazy. games are structured, and and they do this, they've done this twice now. They used to just do Monster Hunter and Pokemon actually have a lot of analogs. Monster Hunter would release a game and then like a year later they would release a G or an Ultimate or so something like that. Some moniker that is like, this is the the bigger expanded version. And this was kind of in the pre-DLC era. And now, just like Pokemon, they release it as a DLC. So base Monster Hunter World has like 37 monsters, something like that. Large monsters. This isn't including the smaller ones. And you have a, all of low rank and all of high rank to play through. And then Iceborne adds something, the total, the total monster count with Iceborne is something like 75, so it like doubles the monsters, and it adds master rank, which I believe includes harder fights for all of the previous monsters, and, and the new monsters, and it adds another story, and it adds like post-game content after all of that. Yeah, That's, I've heard really, really good things about Iceborne. Sunbreak is the same way for uh, Monster Hunter Rise. It gets you up to about the same monster count and adds a post-game and everything. And that's just what they do. Instead of releasing that second game with all the extra content, they just do it as a DLC, which is more consumer-friendly in my mind. It doesn't punish you for buying the game on launch. 
And uh, it's, I don't know, I'm not even, it also added new stuff to the move set, which I haven't really played with. Uh, they actually give you that for the full game if you buy Iceborne. I haven't really messed with it yet, though. I kind of like the uh, the more vanilla Monster Hunter experience without like the gimmicks and stuff. That's kind of why I prefer World to Rise. World is, um, for the uninitiated, Monster Hunter is a game <laughs> where you, you play as these humans that carry these gigantic weapons, giant swords, giant axes. Uh, or or a normal sword and shield sometimes. It, it was originally going to be like a pretty bog-standard fantasy game where you kill monsters with friends. It was just supposed to be a multiplayer monster hunting game. And uh, But it, but it kind of transformed into this more grounded... They are big monsters, but they're not realistic, but they do make sense. Like their, their place in the ecosystem kind of makes sense. You, you, their moveset makes sense given the shape of their body. You could kind of imagine how they would evolve to be that way. And that's kind of important to the ethos of the mainline Monster Hunter games. And they're also not... Some of them breathe fire and stuff, but it all feels like it could be explained. It doesn't feel like magic for the most part. Like, some of them have electricity, but it's explained as, like, bioelectricity. Some of them are venomous. That just makes sense. Some of them can spit fire, but it feels like they have, like, a fuel sack. And they yeah, they do. You can kill them and take the fuel sack and use it to make stuff. Uh, and then just that grounded, um, that grounded experience just really appeals to me. Like, you have to go out. You have to find tracks for the monster you're hunting. And then you follow the tracks, and it, it can take a while sometimes because you have no idea on these huge maps where the monster is. So you follow these tracks, and you find it, and then these really long boss encounters that you get into that can be kind of exhausting uh, if you don't if you don't already know the monster. Once you know them and their move set and everything, you can often knock them out pretty quickly. And you can either capture them or you can kill them, and uh, the result is the same either way. Uh, and it's just a really fun gameplay loop. You're just hunting these monsters over and over. And uh, World has a bunch of different maps. It has 37 monsters in the base game, 75 in the uh, expansion, t- or 75 total after the expansion. And I'm, I don't even think I've seen all the monsters in the game yet. I've played another 25 hours, and I feel like I'm about halfway through the game, a little past halfway. Granted, I took a break a few times in there to uh, grind a little bit to get better gear just because y- you don't even really have to, and especially in the early game. You can probably use the like default armor and get through most of the game. But interestingly, Monster Hunter doesn't really ever... If you're just playing the main story, you're probably never going to get enough resources to get stronger at all. So you're going to hit a wall eventually and kind of be forced to go do some of the optional content and grind a little bit but that doesn't bother me because that's kind of where the main game is. The story is, with the exception of 4 Ultimate, the story in Monster Hunter games tends to be pretty bad. In fact, like the, the, the in World, they tried to do big set pieces. It almost felt like they were trying to do some Uncharted sort of stuff. And those are by far the worst parts of the game. It just doesn't really work. Not because it's bad, but because it's not nearly as good as the actual gameplay where you're hunting the monsters and fighting them and everything. It just feels so good. It is the best action RPG combat of any game I've ever played. I would say the best melee combat in general, but Devil May Cry still has it beat, I think, in my mind. But it just, there, there's like 14 weapon types, and each of them have their own combos, their own, like, quirks that you have to learn. They all have, like, mechanics that the, the other weapons don't have at all. Like, they, they genuinely, like, it can feel like a totally different game when you pick up a new weapon in Monster Hunter. And I just, I don't know. I, I see how people are putting thousands of hours into this. I don't think I'm going to do that. But I could see me playing it. I'm nowhere near done with it right now. I'm just obsessed. I can't put it down. That's awesome. Uh, that's crazy that you've, you've come back to a game that you've already largely, you know, like you're basically done with and you're, and you're obsessed with it again. I thought I had beaten it, but I, I think they might have rolled credits after low rank ended. And I was like, ah, oh, that's the end of the game. And that's not even that's not even the end of the tutorial. <laughs> like you're still learning new mechanics well into high rank. I'm like two levels into high rank right now. And there's a lot of game ahead of me. And not not even you know, I haven't even touched Iceborne. Iceborne is going to be an entire other game to play. 
I, I don't know. It's crazy. And there's j- just for reference, they now granted these numbers are probably inflated a little because Capcom did a like return to world event to try to hype up Wilds since World is the most recent mainline game. Uh, but there's like 50,000 people playing this on Steam right now. Wow. For a game from like 2018. Yeah, man, I keep saying it, but I I really do believe it. I think Monster Hunter Wilds is going to it's going to blow up big. Yeah. It's weird. I want to play Rise again as well because I want to compare and contrast them on a deeper level because I remember playing Rise and I remember not liking it as much as World, but that was a while ago. Uh I played it when it first came to PC, I think. And I just don't remember it that well. Uh but I also know that I have so much Monster Hunter World ahead of me. I don't know, even if I just played these games, I don't know if I would be able to happily get my fill of both of them by the time Wilds came out. <laughs> and I do want to play other games at some point. There's just so much to these games. Man, Capcom, how do you do it? I don't like, know. <laughs> it's it's kind of crazy. Their output, the quality of their output, it's it's amazing. The, and it's so weird to me how similar uh, Monster Hunter faces a lot of the same problems Pokemon does. They they want to do their yearly releases, and they found a great solution, which I think Pokemon is moving towards, but they have their one team, and then a DLC for that game, and then their other team, and then a DLC for that game. And now the other team has had like three or four years to work on their next game before it comes out. They also have Monster Hunter Stories on the side, which is like a turn-based Pokemon kind of thing. I don't really have any interest in that. I haven't played it. But they also, like... I think the most monsters that have ever been in a Monster Hunter game... Monster Hunter ran into the we-can't-put-every-monster-in-the-game-every-time problem way faster than Pokemon did because these are, like, whole boss fights that have environments and mechanics that are exclusive to them. Uh, Like, some of the monsters just don't make sense to fight outside of their element. So if you don't have those things in the game, you're not going to have that monster. But Monster Hunter, I mean, Monster Hunter 3 only had 18 monsters in it when it launched. Like, and nobody complained. People loved that game. And now they have like 75. I actually, Monster Hunter Generations had almost 100. And I've actually seen people saying that it had too many monsters. People were saying that it was bloated. Can you imagine somebody saying that about a Pokemon game? Like Pokemon Company, Game Freak would kill to have somebody saying that. It's, It's kind of funny. Ugh. But Monster Hunter also hasn't thrown away every ounce of good faith that the community has given them. They they typically respect their community and communicate pretty openly and give you a good value. Yeah, I I don't know. I do feel to an extent that I'm missing something by not playing World, but I guess as a new fan, I just have to sort of accept it and then just jump into Wilds and, and see what I think. Every next game is better at onboarding new players than the previous one, like it, it, it just consistently. And there's no like, there's no story that you're going to wish you knew or anything. That's why they got rid of the numbers for the mainline entries was because they didn't want somebody to think they needed to play th- four to play five. So they went to r- World and Wilds and Wilds is confirmed to be Monster Hunter 6. You can tell by the logo having the six serpent heads on it, but also Capcom has just said it. So that, that'll be a perfectly good time to jump in. Yeah. Hopefully it has cross-play and everything. I think it oh, will. Oh, I'm sure it will. It's the first one they're doing a simultaneous release. Every other one has come to console first and PC later, or been exclusive or or something. And that's so frustrating. I mean, these games, these games were trapped on 3DS for so long. <laughs> yeah, I mean, these were handheld games for the longest time. I know, which is so funny. That's the other weird thing where they have... Like, the portable versus mainline thing, it's so weird that they've stuck to that. They need to, like, come out with something official because all of them were portable, and now all of them are home console. Like, they need... They have to say something to, like, let people know because Rise is a vastly different game from World, and, like, if you go in not knowing that, you you could very well be disappointed. But that's my two cents about Monster Hunter. I I would recommend it to anybody. Can't, Can't put it down. Awesome. Mike? I, like the masochist I am, am back into modded Minecraft. Oh, what mod? Uh, Remember that mod pack I was playing like a year ago or something? Eternal? But, yeah, Eternal. Eternal. I dove back yeah. into Eternal after... Oh, my God. After saying so many bad things about it, I'm like, you know what? 
I'm feeling like a masochist. I want to die again. I liked it. My PC just couldn't handle it. Uh, it. It runs better now than it used to. Like, I'm running it on my PC, and it's running fine now. They've optimized a good bit of the performance issues in, like, the year and a half since I played it last. Yeah, there's so much in it. They removed some of the old mods that I never used anyway, and then they added, like, robot creepers from Mars or whatever. <laughs> I, I don't know the mod name. I'm scared to ask, but I know I'll encounter them, encounter them somewhere. Eternal walks like a razor thin line between like 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 on the edge of being too bloated. I, I've played a lot of Minecraft mod packs that like I immediately turn off because they just feel extremely bloated. There's just too much going on. And I didn't I got really close to feeling that with Eternal. But Yeah, Eternal yeah, I, I Eternal was able to has stick with it. Thin line of is it bloated? Maybe, but it's not too bloated. Yeah. Which I think Changes how I approach the mod pack. I'm trying to remember what I even did in it. I know it had like dimensional doors, right? It and does it have dimensional doors. I'm big dimensional screwing doors around. Fan. Yeah, I'm screwing around with different mod packs that I haven't used. Like I'm using immersive engineering more than I've used it before. Yeah, and it's it's interesting to have a mod pack with so many options because yeah. uh, I could play through this entirely differently. I don't have to sit here and. Pretend I like using um, Mechanism as the mod that I use all the yeah. time. Which I, I ha- sometimes I have to pretend I like. Because everyone yeah. loves using Mechanism. The only really problems I have with it are it's, it's difficult. Like getting one shot by a wizard early game is not fun. And the fact that there's so much bloat that I don't know what to do sometimes. Like, if I'm not hyper-fixating on a mod pack, I have no idea what's going on. Yeah. So, other than that, good mod pack. We'll probably drop it here in, like, a week or two. Honestly. Usually that's how it yeah, happens. That's yeah, the Minecraft way. It, it makes yeah. my girlfriend mad that I play it, so... Yeah, I mean, my, Minecraft's just... Minecraft's just the thing you come back to time and time again. Like, it's not something you play forever, but it, it's like comfort food. It's there when you need it. For sure. It also helps that my I refuse to play vanilla anymore. Yeah, I mean, why would you? Like, Yeah, like, why would I play vanilla anymore? Why would you use a blank canvas when you could color it any way you want, basically? Yeah. I, I just don't think of it like that. I still like... I like vanilla Minecraft for its limitation. I like that it's harder to to progress in... I don't know. I still like vanilla Minecraft. It's still a fun game to me. I'm more, par- I'm more impartial against vanilla... Because I think vanilla is, it's super limited and it doesn't give me what I want out of Minecraft. Because I want exploration, I want engaging mechanics, and Minecraft doesn't give me that. I mean, not anymore. I I would argue that if you were new to Minecraft, it would give you both of those things. But you've played it enough that you don't get that anymore. Yeah. Like, it's incredulous, but I played Minecraft so much that, like, it doesn't have the same effect it used to on me. Like, back in the day, Minecraft had the sense of wonder, and now, like, Minecraft worlds aren't built the way they used to be. Back in my day, you know? Well, that's what I was going to say. You got to play it like me, where I only play it, like, once every two or three years, and then it's it's new to me every time I do it. That's how I am, too. Yeah. Except that, you know, you're only going to have one update in that time now, because they slowed the pace down so much. Yeah, back in my day, Minecraft worlds were explorable on foot. Did you guys see the potato update for April Fools? What's that? It was it, they did an April Fools update to Minecraft that added like a poison potato dimension because people always joke about the poison potato being useless. They added a whole dimension that you access through the poison potato and all these new mechanics and stuff. It was genuinely like huge. It was a huge update and it was all just a joke. Like it's not in the main game. Yeah, I'm just saying they so put, they like removed yeah. it after April first or what? They, you can still access it, but it's not it's not canon. Like it's not in the game. You have to like select a special update to play it. Like it's a mod. So you're almost. telling me they put all that effort into a new dimension, but when it comes to the mob votes, they give exactly you the no. That's what people are so whoa. People are really frustrated with them because it seems to be that the problem is bureaucracy. Like at Microsoft, they can't get an update made because they can't get anything done. They can't get anything approved, whereas, like, for a little joke update, they can do whatever they want, and they can do it very quickly, because it doesn't have to be that, it doesn't have to be perfect in the way that 
I, my, I think I think Microsoft is very afraid of messing up Minecraft by ch- making changes to it that are going to uh, kill the golden goose, as it were. No, that makes sense. Like, you, like, like I, w- whether or not it's true, I don't know, but like it's logical that they want to protect that at all costs. Like just for reference, they they made it so you could move a build, like you could um, like you could build a flying machine in this update. Like there was a block you could attach. And all the blocks attached to it, it would become like one entity, and it could move around, like it could fly, like you could build a. Yeah, that's sick. Why can't we have that? Yeah, like that feels straight out of the create mod, and uh, like why can't we? Why not give us that? I don't know, <laughs> but they're not going Microsoft to. Microsoft is scared. They're cowards. Yeah, I mean, I, I bet it was buggy because it was an April Fool's update, but still, it's, I don't know. I'd rather have a buggy fun update than. Me Vanilla too. Buggy, Minecraft, you know? buggy fun updates are how Minecraft became the best selling game in the world. <laughs> yeah, like Minecraft was built on buggy fun updates. That said, Sea of Thieves is like drowning under the bugs right now. Like sometimes you can't even drop your anchor. So like eh, maybe not all the bugs, but a, a glitchy new mechanic is not the end of the world. Yeah. If it's fun. Especially if you can refine that mechanic later. Yeah. It's not going to end the world. And I, I know Microsoft probably doesn't realize that. To Microsoft, a glitch will end the world as they know it. Yeah, because everybody knows Windows doesn't have any bugs. Yeah. Like, my, Windows exists, and we don't, we don't question it, you know? But I question it. I, I sometimes question Windows. <laughs> but, yeah, I don't know. I think, and also the fact that my, Minecraft is spread over eight platforms now stifles a lot of the yeah. a lot of the innovation that Minecraft used to be known for. I don't know, man. Maybe, but a lot of games come out on like eight platforms now. Yeah, but are they continuously updated on those eight platforms and meant to be com- also eight, two separate but... versions? That doesn't help. And the fact that there's no parity between them at the current moment. Yeah, the two still, separate versions doesn't help. Like I just learned the other day that Vanilla Mi- or Bedrock Edition doesn't have the combat update. It's not no parody. There are a few things missing. It, it's mostly parody. Like a seed will give you the same world in both, for like, instance. What, but why is the combat update missing? Where? Why can't they, they suffer can't get, too? Because it wouldn't work on mobile phones. The The mobile port is what holds it back mostly. Yeah. Give me my neat, uh, my stupid uh, sword swinging mechanic that I hate anyway. Give it to me. Just give it yeah. to me. I know it's bad for me, but I don't care. So what have you been playing, Amid? So I've been playing a little bit of Dragon's Dogma, but I talked about that last week. The new game I've been playing is Ultros. Have either of you heard of this game? No, what is that? So this is a Metroidvania, a 2D Metroidvania, with a few unique mechanics to it. So I guess the premise is that your character, which I think is an alien, they're wearing a suit, definitely very inspired by Metroid. Like, the main character is definitely kind of like a Samus analog, I think. But she wakes up, uh, she's all suited up in this space suit, but she's on this ship in space, floating in space, called the Sarcophagus. And it's this giant ship, but it might also be alive, like... It's very hard to know. The lore in this game is very kind of mysterious and obscured, and you just sort of have to piece things together. But you're in this giant ship. Oh, you're looking at screenshots? Yeah. I'm looking at the trailer right now, yeah. Yeah, and it's 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 the ship, but like it's also sort of alive. Like it's a living ship, maybe, and there's like plants everywhere and life everywhere. And you're on this ship and you're trapped there, basically. And the only way to not get trapped there is to basically break out of this time loop you're stuck in. Oh, my God. So, l- pulling from a lot of things there, but it's a, it's a beautiful game. Like, the most striking thing about this game is its art style, and it's just neon, psychedelic colors everywhere. It's just like, how did... It's a very impressive art style, I think. It, it took a lot of creativity to make something that looks like this. Yeah, I don't know how I missed this. This came out two months ago. Yeah, so it, it's, and and let me expand on the, I guess, the time loop mechanic a little bit. You might think, oh, is it a roguelike? No, it's not a roguelike. It's definitely a Metroidvania. But what happens is 
when you reset the loop, right? So you basically, the flow of the game is you wake up, you have nothing, you get your weapon, you complete part of the map, and then you eventually kill a boss, and then you go to the central area and you basically restart the loop. So when all of that happens, you do actually lose everything except for... Well, actually, okay, so let me back up. You do actually lose everything, but the map is still updated from what you did, and it becomes quicker each time to regain all the stuff you lost. So I guess there's some, I guess, roguelike mechanics, but not really, right? The map stays populated, the changes to the map stay there, and what's interesting about this game is that, like, yes, there's combat, like you're, like you'd think of in a roguelike Right, like so, two D kind of combat. There's jumping, double jumping, ground pounds, what have you. But the other core mechanic to this game is gardening, but hmm. not in like a farming sense. So there's these rare kind of fruits and seeds on this on this ship. Right, like I said, it's a very like bio themed ship, and as you progress through the game you can plant these seeds in specific spots and some of them won't take effect until your next loop, right? So you, you might have to like plan ahead to an extent. But a lot of these seeds, what they allow are changes to the world. So planting a seed in one place might open up a path that was previously blocked or planting a different seed might create a platform that you can then jump on to get to a new area. So different seeds do different things and the seeds sort of evolve through the loops. And that's like the other big mechanic in this game. Uh, the combat is is good. It's not as tight as I would like, right? Like as something like Hollow Knight, for example. I really yeah. enjoy the tight nature of the movement and the combat in this game. The Mechanically, it's not as accomplished as Hollow Knight, but I guess few things are. But yeah, the movement, the jumping, the the combat is definitely serviceable. But I would say the highlight is just the world and the art style. And I guess the unique sort of uh, planting mechanics and how those feed into the game. Another sort of unique thing with this game is that when you fight an enemy and you kill it, they drop, I guess, a piece of themselves, right? So if, if you fought an enemy with a tentacle, they drop like some tentacles or like a limb or something. And you actually eat that to recover health. So... The dropped enemy body parts are your food for recovering health. But not only are they food, they're also your XP system. So you have like four different stats that you can increase. And increasing those four stats will allow you to spend down on them to basically unlock certain skills. So it's a unique thing where like the thing you use to heal is the same as the thing that you use for getting new skills. So depending on the enemy you kill and depending on how well you kill that enemy, right? So if you, if you end up using a lot of the same attack, getting hit or whatever, the quality of the food they drop is less than if you were like not get hit and kill it with a variety of moves. So the quality of the food improves with the quality of the kill on, on that creature. And when the quality of the food improves, it, imp it increases the amount of health it restores and it gives you higher like stat points too. So you spend these stat points, you get, you get new skills. There are items you can find in the run that preserve your skills throughout loops, right? So if you weren't able to find any of those items, by default, everything would reset at the end of a loop, which was frustrating initially. At my first loop, I was like, okay, this is kind of lame. But as I played the game more, I was just like, okay, it's not actually that bad. Like the main thing you have to do when, when the loop restarts is go get your weapon and then go to where you get the double jump, and then you're basically back in business. Because the thing that gives you your double jump also stores a lot of your like permanent skills that you gain as you progress through the world. So returning to that spot and getting that thing basically brings you back to a level of where you're like, okay, I'm virtually back to where I was before, before the loop uh, ended. And the game is very open-ended. Like... Um, as Metroidvanias tend to be, right? That you can basically explore in any direction. Like, and if you're limited, you'll find that out pretty quickly. But it's a game where you can tackle things in 
any order more than most Metroidvanias, I think. And it does seem to me that there are ways to get through objectives, even if you don't have specific skills or items, that, uh, again, you don't really see in a lot of Metroidvanias, because in Metroidvanias, typically, you have to get the skill or item to get to uh, one section or another. And that doesn't always seem to be the case with this game. So I- I'm quite enjoying my time with this game. Again, like if if nothing else, please just look at some screenshots or some videos of this game, because... Like holy moly, the art style is just—it's just really something special. It looks sick. And, it deserves more attention than it's getting. This is the first I've heard of it. Yeah, yeah. I don't think I think this game really flew under under the radar. And actually, funny story, I did not know about this either. And I just looked on the PlayStation Store, and it was like on the front page. And just from the screenshot, I was like, I want to play this game. I knew That's nothing like the else. Most about magical it. feeling. I love. Yeah, it and, and I was just gonna say, like, that doesn't happen too often anymore. Like, that's a pretty unique thing to have happen to me, at least. But I saw it, and I was just like, I want to play this game. And it, I'm glad I did. I'm having a good time with it. I still think about um, a time that I went to a vintage game store and saw a cartridge that j- caught my eye, bought it for, like, five bucks, and went home and played it, and it ended up being a banger. Like, that's just such a rare experience in today's yeah. world to just have no influence at all. A game you've never heard of, you just you, yeah. you think the art looks pretty, you pick it no up. No coverage, no news, nothing. Like I never heard of it. I just like okay, this looks really cool. I'm gonna play it and That's try it. A, such a good feeling, yeah. So and and it definitely is worth your time, especially if you're a fan of Metroidvanias, sci-fi, uh, psychedelic art styles. This this really checks those boxes, and it's not too long either. I think it's somewhere around like eight to ten hours. So definitely a manageable game. And uh, a game that sh- right now. should, quite frankly, be getting a lot more love, I think. Don't know if it will be by the time this episode comes out. Should be, yeah. Offer ends April 22nd. Yeah, 20% off on Steam. Well, there you go. Ultros. Ultros. U-L-T-R-O-S. Yeah, Ultros is the name. So, like, um, the reason you're trapped on the ship, by the way is because this time loop is perpetuated by, like, this demon that's sleeping at the center of the ship, and it's called Ultros. And the ultimate goal is to, like, kill this demon so everyone can escape. It's a cool cool game, cool idea, cool art. Why is it bundled with Hotline Miami? The art style was done by the same artist who did the art for Hotline Miami. That's a, pre- that's a pretty good game, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I see it now that I. Now oh, that I'm also looking. the music in this game is very, very good. Oh, okay. I wouldn't have very known that because I've, I've been watching the trailer on mute, <laughs> so I could hear you talk. Yeah, there's a free demo on Steam. That one might. Uh, that one might sneak its way onto the old Steam Deck. Oh, perfect Steam Deck game. Yeah. Yeah. Especially with those colors on an OLED screen. Wow. Well, you don't have to remind me that I have the old. Steam oh, Steam you don't deck. have. Oh, I didn't even mean to do <laughs> oh, that. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, it hurts. Oh, man. Well, sorry for that unintentional burn. I just have to use my real OLED TV. (laughs) Boo-hoo. (laughs) Boo-hoo. Woe is me. (laughs) All right. Well, yeah, that's all I've been playing. I definitely wanted to shout Ultros out because I think it's a pretty special game. So, Yeah, I'm glad you did. All right. Thank you all for listening. You can follow us at Podcast Game Talk on Twitter and Instagram and game talk on tiktok click the link in the description to join our discord and talk to us there please like rate and review us on uh, soundcloud spotify apple Podcasts, or any other podcast services you use thank you all for listening yeah see you guys next week see you next see you next week bye